just past the primaries before the election. And uh, no, it was August, actually, because it was his birthday. Uh, so um, uh, my friend brought me, and we were supposed to meet some other friends outside, and we missed them. So we went in without them and you know, through security and the whole thing. And then I could see our friends off on the side of the stage where the birthday cake was, but right in the front. And, I wanted to tell them we had actually made it. So we started making our way through the crowds and we were actually standing behind this woman, not in front of her, I, let me emphasize, but behind her. And she got really angry and she turned around and started yelling, you know, do you know how long I've been standing here and my feet hurt and you have the nerve to like cut through all these people and you know, who do you think you are and all that. and and. Uh, I could feel the friend who had brought me, she's starting to fume. And I just said to this woman, you know, you're right. We did just get here. You've been here a long time. I'm just going to let our friends know that we actually made it. And then we're going to go stand somewhere else. And so I'm telling the story. Bob yells out, what kind of Leo are you? <laughs> you should have gone right in front of that woman. <laughs> so we're different kinds of Leos, actually. And I'm not sure I, I have my uh, Leo authentic card from him, but I am a Leo. Yes, <laughs> thank you. Okay, so long suffering uh, director, producer, and cameraman uh, Jeff is asking if you uh, you could move up, if that's. Thank you. It's almost New Year's Eve. <laughs> well, we, we've done this retreat in the past. It's always ended on um, January 1st. But this year, I kind of thought, well, might be hard for people not to have any weekend days uh, and you know for everything to be the work week and since New Year's Day is Friday strangely enough um, so we're straddling it which we've never quite done before so uh, but it's fun personally I'm a night owl so <laughs> fine with me um, so uh, I talked about meditation as being a skills training in concentration, mindfulness, and loving kindness or compassion. The foundation often is considered concentration, and that is training our attention so that it's more stable. It has more steadiness, not like an uptight squeezing of our energy um, but both the ability to rest on an object and the ability to let go probably a lot of different distractions. Um, and so over time, it's like two things happen, they say. I mean, a lot happens, but primarily two things. One is all that energy that's been scattered, fragmented all over the place returns to us and becomes available to us so that we feel the power of that. And so concentration is like a training in power in strength. And the other thing that happens is that um, it's a movement, it's a kind of healing process. It's a movement toward integration, toward wholeness. So those disparate fragmented parts of ourselves more come together. On that basis, we often practice this quality called mindfulness which I, yesterday I called it the word of the hour. I have a, a friend suggested to me that I put in a Google alert on mindfulness, you know, the way you can for a politician or a movie star or something like that. 
and it's so much fun. Like every single day, <laughs> there are just tons of articles on mindfulness. And who would have guessed? Um, as I said, classically, the term means something like being aware of what's happening in the present moment without adding a whole lot of stuff to it. The kind of stuff we tend to add, things like holding on, pushing away, comparing to what we think should be happening, projecting into a seemingly uh, dismal future. Oh no, this hurts. How bad is it going to be in a week, in a month, whatever it might be. Um, there are lots of just sheer habits of mind that tend to be overwhelming when we're not mindful of them. They come up and maybe we're experiencing something that could be really joyous, really wonderful. And for whatever reason, we're not able to fully experience the, the joy of it in the moment. Maybe we're so distracted, we're not even taking it in. Maybe we have some idea of what should be happening. I often tell the story about, I go to Washington, D.C. Um, frequently to teach. And one year I went during cherry blossom season, you know, when the cherry trees are, are kind of in bloom. And that there's that concentrated area where there are so many trees. And I was so busy that year that I only got down there at night. So the following year, a friend of mine hearing that I had only gotten there at night was determined to get me there during the day. So we got there during the day. And I just thought it was so beautiful, those delicate pink blossoms and so many of them. And I, I was just in awe. And then my friend said, oh, no, it's past the peak. And then I thought, oh, no, I'm having a bad experience. It's past the peak. It's not good enough. You know, so maybe we have the intrusion of that kind of thinking that takes away or detracts from our ability to experience the joy. Or maybe we have uh, this feeling we don't deserve it, you know. And so there are all kinds of ways in which we sort of subtly or, or more overtly sort of push the joy away and, and distort what's happening. It's really not that good, believe me. Um, and certainly we can have a very distorted relationship to pain, to difficulty, to challenge. Some of that is personal conditioning, some of that is cultural conditioning, where we're just in a way we're taught it's wrong often. Not always, but often, you know, it's just wrong. You should have been able to control things. There's, um, you know, there's no reason for you to feel what you're feeling. Other people are worse off. Um, all kinds of things so that when something is difficult, as in Sylvia's immortal, immortal example now, we add what her granddaughter thought was even worse and adding the horseradish to the gefilte fish. So um, we can have a really, really hard thing going and in fact make it worse. We get isolated instead of feeling a sense of community with others and recognizing this is just part of the human condition, whatever it is. We blame ourselves as though we could successfully say, well, I've thought about it really carefully and I've decided never to be afraid again. Or I've suffered long enough, it's over now. Certainly we can affect the conditions and, and influence a lot of things, but the way we feel, we seem to feel we should be in complete control, it's just a fantasy. And yet we pile on so much of the time, projecting into the future. It's very interesting to notice, say, with physical pain, how much of the suffering is coming from the actual sensation and how much is coming from all that anticipation. It's going to be this way forever. Oh, it'll be so much worse in a year. Right? It's just, it's very powerful to begin to understand. Not that nothing's going to hurt. I mean, some things in life really hurt. They just do. 
I don't care how open-minded you are, uh, they hurt. And we can pile on. And we have a lot of power to learn not to do that. Right? So we learn to relate to difficulty, to pain, to uh, that which is unpleasant differently. Then there's a whole teaching about being mindful of neutral experience, just kind of ordinary routine, repetitive blah moments where we usually kind of numb out, we go to sleep, we wait for something more stimulating or exciting to happen in order to feel alive. So mindfulness is by definition a quality of awareness where we might fully feel the pleasure of something, but we don't do that extra thing of either clinging, how am I gonna keep it from ever changing or we're getting weird about it in some way. And we can fully open to painful experience without adding the things that make it worse, but rather having a more compassionate, heartful experience that allows us to connect with one another. And we can actually wake up and be aware during neutral experience instead of being half alive. That is mindfulness, being aware of what's happening in the present moment without any grasping, aversion, or delusion. Delusion in this sense, in this context, is that kind of numbness or spacing out when something's not very gripping for us. So the thing about mindfulness is that it's not dependent on its object. It's about how we're relating to that object. So even though we kind of believe that ordinary sort of neutral or unpleasant experience in meditation practice is a bad sign. It's actually not. It's just what's happening in the moment. And we tend to believe that really pleasant, extraordinary things happening in our meditation is a really good sign. And it's not. Because it all depends on how we're relating to it. The calm, the peace, the joy, the sense of sufficiency, the sense of inner abundance, the love come from that relationship, not from the object itself. And so that's why um, there's a tremendous freedom in practicing mindfulness. We may start with the breath, being aware of the breath, and then building on top of that, we, we open our awareness so that we become aware of whatever's predominant. So maybe it's the breath, sensation, an emotion, back to the breath. So it's the quality of that awareness that, that we're really cultivating. It's why, it's another reason why we say you cannot fail at this. You can't be having the wrong experience. You can have an experience you wouldn't want to write home about, but you know, uh, my next blog is going to be about sleepiness, restlessness, pain. You know, it's not what we really want, but it's okay. It's actually fine. So the fruits or the benefits of mindfulness are several also with, again, two primary ones. One that's very popular, one that is almost never talked about, uh, and it's what Bob was alluding to yesterday. The first benefit is really inhabiting our lives. It is being able to go to Washington, D.C. and have your friends say, oh, it's past the peak and not buying into that. It's seeing a thought as a thought and really being more in touch. Instead of like perpetually uh, falling into what uh, my friend Linda Stone calls continuous partial attention which is sort of the way of our time, or he's multitasking, we're like all over the place, we can actually experience, like feel the warmth of the teacup and smell the tea and taste the tea. Normally we're drinking that cup of tea and we're also checking our email and also on the conference call and also watching the TV on mute, reading the crawl. So it doesn't tend to be really an extraordinary cup of tea, does it? And it is so rare that we look at the quality of our attention as playing any role at all in our degree of satisfaction. Mostly we blame the tea. Uh, I can't believe I still use tea bags. That is so stupid. 
I'm gonna go to that gourmet tea shop. I'm gonna buy all that loose tea. I'm gonna buy, I think I need a strainer and I need a tea ball. Maybe I don't need both, but anyway, I'll buy both just in case. <laughs> and I'll heat up the tea to that perfect temperature, whatever that is, like they do in England. And I'm gonna make the perfect cup of tea. But if we make the perfect cup of tea and we drink it in just the way we drank the old cup of tea, it's not gonna be very fulfilling. And then we're in a cycle, right? We're in a loop. What do I have to do? Do I have to go to India to get the tea right from the tea plantation? So uh, some of you heard me say, I saw myself quoted on Twitter, which of course is just 140 characters or less. And it said, sometimes just drink the cup of tea, Sharon Salzberg. <laughs> And I thought, that makes zero sense. <laughs> like none out of context, but it's what I'll be famous for, watch. Sometimes just drink a cup of tea. So when mindfulness is talked about, like on my Google alert, you know, when I get all those articles, this is what people are primarily talking about. And it's wonderful. You know, if we weren't so crazy trying with enormous futility, trying to find that perfect cup of tea and never noticing that we're not really there to experience it, it would be a better life. It would be a different world. The second benefit of mindfulness is really what the whole classical teaching is about, and that is using mindfulness for insight. It's not just having a better cup of tea and a better experience washing dishes, as wonderful as those are, but it's really understanding who we are in a whole other way. It's having very personal, direct insight into a lot of things. What really makes us happy? What brings us down? What causes us pain? There's so many things we do because we've just assumed or we've been taught, that's really great. That's gonna bring you so much joy and we actually look, it doesn't feel that good, in fact. We don't feel that powerful when we've told a lie. We actually feel kind of frightened about being found out or endless fantasies of revenge on some very superficial level seem to be strong or give us strength, but let's really look an unadorned, unembellished way. What does it really feel like? Just looping around again. It's like when you're going through the list of someone's faults and you go through it again and again and again and again. You don't even think of new faults. It's just like the same list again. Then you look at the clock and you think, oh my God, the whole morning's gone. What a way to spend a life. And we look at the things that maybe we've been taught bring us down, you know, make us weak, sentimental, foolish, like love, like compassion. And we look at them directly to understand their nature, their flavor, their, their texture, and we see the strength in that. Like, look at that. That didn't make me foolish. That didn't make me kind of overly sentimental and conflict avoidant and all of those things I had just assumed. So we develop insight from seeing clearly just the nature of our experience. We see who we are and recognize not just conceptually, but really experientially that we are part of an interconnected universe, that we are part of a web, that every moment is a confluence of conditions coming together and coming apart. It's like for a few moments now, if you could just reflect on bringing to mind anybody who has had any role in your being here in this room right now. Because no one, I am sure, was driving down that road and saw a sign that said Panther Kill Road and said, I'm gonna go in there. Right, we're all here because of conversations we've had and interactions and somebody gave us a book or read us a poem or told us about this place or told us about their practice or there's so many beings in a way represented here in this moment. 
each of us is like that conduit for all these relationships. So this moment in time is all these relationships coming together and then shifting and then changing. That's a, a part of reality. It's not fanciful or it's not like wishful thinking or anything like that. It's actually the way things are. That our lives have something to do with one another. It's just the nature of things. That's wisdom. That's insight. As Bob was saying yesterday, it doesn't mean you disappear, you know, or that uh, there's some part of you that's been your friend, your companion, that's been showing you a good time, and then it's gone. Um, we just see more clearly. Oh, look at that. It's like there's a way of looking at a tree and seeing it as a tree. It's just standing there, right? It's a thing. It's a, it's a seemingly solid entity. And there's another way of looking at the tree and understanding the influence of the nature of the soil, which is nourishing it and everything that affects the quality of that soil, and like the rainfall, and everything that affects the quality of that rainfall, which we now know is, is pretty vast. So you look at the tree and you also see that it's part of a network of relationships. That's also the tree. So that's interconnection. It's interconnection is emptiness, actually. Not that there is no tree. Not that you can't look at it in the old way. Oh, it's just a tree standing there. But we can also look at it in a, another, it's like another dimension of what's true and often overlooked. Look at that, all those connections. That's the nature of things. So that's mindfulness leading to insight about change, about emptiness, about who we are, about what brings us happiness, what brings us sorrow. And then the last is compassion. I talked yesterday about self-compassion. Every time we let go and begin again, we're really practicing some self-compassion. And it's also a, a compassionate sense toward others. To some extent, the compassion is a kind of inevitable result from seeing more clearly. If we really felt ourselves to be part of this network, part of this whole, we would respond differently to one another. The creation of the other would be quite different. And it's also, certainly within the Buddhist framework, it is very possible to train these qualities to actually cultivate loving kindness, cultivate compassion. I know that sounds weird and it sounds cold and kind of mechanistic. Like I went to Menla Mountain Retreat Center and I came out compassionate, you know, or I got my certificate in compassion, but um, the belief is that something like loving kindness or compassion, uh, these are emergent qualities of how we pay attention. You know what it's like if you're talking to somebody and you're not really listening to them and you're thinking about the email you need to write or something, and then you just listen and you're really there and you have a whole other sense of connection with them just from actually being there instead of being so distracted. It's a little bit like that. Or maybe we hold a very strong fixed view about ourselves or others and we manage to drop it for a moment and really listen. How we pay attention, what we pay attention to really creates the ground that loving kindness and compassion can emerge from. And so here too, it's an attention training. I don't know how many of you have seen one of the um, most fun things I've ever done, uh, which I really only did in some minor way, was um, this site called happify.com made an animation of me telling a story, which I'm about to tell you. And uh, for some reason, every character in the animation is a dog. 
so you get to see me as a dog and it's so cute. It's like this dog's mouth moves and my voice comes out telling the story about training compassion. So I highly recommend the animation. Uh, they've just done one with Dan Harris, who's a mouse. And I believe I'm a cat in the next one. I'm not totally sure. And they're all on my website too. But um, this is the story. I was talking about, um, uh, I, have, I live in Massachusetts, but I have had, over the years, various sublets in, in New York City. And uh, there was one time I was living in a certain neighborhood, and uh, I had a friend who's a writer who also lived in that neighborhood, and I was reading a manuscript of his. And in the manuscript, he talked about frequently going into the corner grocery store there and very commonly seeing the same person, the same woman working behind the counter. And he said that he realized that even though he goes in there so frequently, he really had very little sense of her, except maybe a very vague kind of fleeting sense that maybe she wasn't that happy or she was a little bit grim or something like that. But mostly it was just indifference, you know, really kind of oblivious to her. And he was so shocked at seeing that in himself that what he wrote was that for all I recognize she was a living, breathing human being who wanted to be happy just as I do, she might as well have been a cash register with arms. And so he decided, OK, I'm going to go into the store and I'm going to pay complete attention to her. So he did that. He went into the store, and the first thing he noticed was that she was singing along to something on the radio and that she had a really beautiful voice. So he said to her, wow, you have a really beautiful voice. And she just lit up. And she gave him this big, radiant smile. So I was reading that in his manuscript, and I thought, wow, I go into that store all the time, too. I don't really pay any attention to her either, pretty much, except this very vague sense that she's not that happy. So I thought, OK. Can't really go into the store and say, I read you have a really beautiful voice, because it's like completely bizarro. But I can go in there and say, I heard you have a really beautiful voice. So I thought that could be normal conversation, right? So I thought, I'm going to go in there and I'm going to say, I heard you have a really beautiful voice. I'm going to watch her light up. And she's just going to get so happy. So I went into the store. And the first thing I noticed was she was already lit up. She looked perfectly happy. And I thought, oh, kind of, that's too bad. Like, <laughs> and I realized how much of her I likely missed all those days. I went in there not really looking at her. So when we actually pay attention to somebody, it is the conduit for a very natural sense of connection to arise. And We'll keep exploring loving kindness and compassion throughout our, our time here. It's never totally separate from wisdom. Otherwise, it would just be sentimentality. It would be something else. But it is a quality of attention that can be trained. And then we really have a different life because we have a, a much greater sense of of connection that is happening. So in addition to kind of the quiet ways it's cultivated, like letting go and beginning again, and the birth of qualities like loving kindness and compassion born of insight, we also have practices that are just dedicated to strengthening those qualities. So because it's going to be New Year's Eve tonight, I'm sure we're going to do some I thought we could do some now um, to finish off the morning session. And then we'll keep exploring that practice in all kinds of forms um, throughout these days. So in the formal practice of loving kindness meditation, rather than resting your attention on the feeling of the breath, and rather than trying to be mindful particularly of all the many things that come and go, which we can go back to as a practice. Um, we choose certain phrases 
and we rest our attention on the repetition of those phrases. The phrases are the conduit for paying attention differently. So for example, if you're in the habit of looking at yourself at the end of the day and pretty well, only recollecting the things you did wrong or what you could have done better, let's just say, and the practice of loving kindness can be seen as a stretch. You know, maybe at the end of the day, as you kind of evaluate yourself, you just fixate on that really stupid thing you said at lunch at the meeting. So much so that your whole sense of who you are and all that you will ever be just collapses around that comment you made. So the practice of loving kindness is one of wishing yourself well. It's almost like recollecting anything else happened today? Any good within me? any capacity to change. So we're stretching, but we're not moving from a true place to an untrue place. We're moving from a true place to another true place that usually doesn't get much airtime, right? So we're challenging that fixation, that collapse. We wish ourselves well. And then we extend that by offering the phrases to other beings, those we feel close to, those we don't know that well, like that shopkeeper, those that we have some difficulty with. There are many, many ways of doing it. And it culminates in the offering of loving kindness through these phrases to all beings everywhere, to all of life. So any one session of practice, because that would be a lot to get in, you know, all these different relationships. We usually start with ourselves and end with all beings. And then it kind of depends on what's happening in your life, what you might choose to put in the middle. Maybe you have a friend who's getting an award today, you know, and you want to spend some time with them. Maybe you have a friend who's in trouble and you want to mentally, emotionally spend some time with them. Maybe you're going to the store today and you've chosen that shopkeeper as a, a recipient of, of loving kindness, whatever it might be. There are lots and lots of ways of, of playing in that middle portion. The power of the practice comes from, once again, concentration. And that is gathering all your attention behind one phrase at a time. We know what these phrases mean. So it's not just like repeating any old thing. But you don't want to be trying to somehow manufacture some enormous feeling. It doesn't matter. I've done this practice a lot. And I've done it a lot not feeling any great thing, thinking nothing was happening, only to discover in life where it counts, oh, I'm different. Look at that. I'm meeting people differently. I'm treating myself differently. Look at that. So it's kind of an adventure or an experiment that's best done without a lot of um, compulsion. Like, I've got to feel this or I've got to finish, you know, uh, working through that relationship by Sunday. Um, but much more a sense of experimentation. Like, let me just try it. Let me see what happens. Um, usually we choose three or four phrases. And they need to be very general because it's very disruptive to concentration if you're continually trying to think of new phrases with every new person. Uh, that's not to say you should feel imprisoned by the phrases. Sometimes someone comes to mind and a very different set of phrases comes with them. And that's fine, but you don't really want to be sitting here endlessly thinking, what about you? Let me think, you know. Um, and they need to be more open. <clears throat> so it's not just for ourselves. It can really apply to others. It's not like, may I beat the traffic on Sunday, you know, but like, more like, may I be happy. Um, common phrases, and you don't have to use these phrases, Remember, they're all translations. Common phrases, bless you, beginning with ourselves, are, may I be safe? 
be happy, be healthy, live with ease. Live with ease means in the things of day-to-day -day life like livelihood or family, may not be such a struggle. May I live with ease. May I be safe, be happy, be healthy, live with ease. The words being words are gonna be imperfect. I usually suggest you choose good enough phrases. The feeling tone is not, sometimes the may I or may you kind of throws people. It's not meant to be pleading or imploring. Uh, my friend Sylvia Borstein told me once, she said it's the hortatory subjunctive part of speech. Um, she said, it's like you hand someone a birthday card and you say, may you have a happy birthday. May you have a great new year. May you have a great new year, right? It's got some verve to it. May I be happy. May you be happy. Um, so you choose three or four phrases. And I'll make suggestions about the um, process and moving through these different categories. Begin with yourself through the phrases, offering this sense of well-wishing to yourself. The skill set is really the same. Your mind will likely wander a billion times. It's OK. See if you can let go and come back. And then billion and one, OK. Just let go and come back. In this case, come back to the phrases. OK, so let's sit together. You want to sit comfortably. Again, you can close your eyes or not. See if there are three or four phrases that seem to be workable for you, that are good enough. Phrases like, may I be safe, be happy, be healthy, live with ease. The feeling tone is gift giving, it's offering. Instead of carping one more time on our faults. We're giving this gift of well-wishing, of this kind of beneficent attention. May I be safe, be happy. These phrases or any phrases that really work for you, it seems, just repeat them over and over again with enough space and enough silence in between.
And think of someone who's been like a benefactor for you. Maybe they've helped you directly, they've helped pick you up when you've fallen down, or maybe you've never met them, but they've inspired you from afar. This is like an embodiment of the force of love for you. The texts say, this is the one whom when you think of them, you smile. So who makes you smile? Could be an adult, could be a child, could even be a pet. Who represents that force of love for you? And if someone comes to mind, you can bring them here. Get an image of them, say their name to yourself. Get a feeling for their presence and offer the phrases of loving kindness to them. Even if the words don't seem perfect, it's okay. They're offering the heart's energy. And then someone here you didn't know before you got here. You still might not know their name, but you could just get a feeling for them. So here's someone who inevitably wants to be happy just as we do, who is vulnerable to change and to loss just as we are. So even not knowing anything about their particular story, see what happens as you offer the phrases of loving kindness to them.
And then everybody here, which involves a whole variety of different relationships, those whom you may know quite well, those whom you don't know at all, and yourself. So the phrase has become something like, may we be safe, be happy, be healthy, live with ease. And then all beings everywhere, all people, all creatures, all those in existence, near and far, known and unknown. May all beings be safe, be happy, be healthy, live with ease.
Uh, thank you. All beings, thank you. We'll have time for questions this afternoon and tonight. Uh, it's time now to break for yoga. Thank you. <laughs>